Thank you, everyone, and welcome to the Smart Grid Seminar. Today, we are very happy that uh, our two speakers, Sandy and Andrew, are uh, here in present. I want to remind everyone that our next seminar is next uh, Thursday, uh, same time. And we have a speaker from Andrew talking about uh, power system and energy tools. Let me quickly uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, Andy is a principal planning and strategy analyst in Portland General Electrics. Distribution, distributed resource planning team. He has over 10 years of experience in the energy industry focusing on distributed resources across both planning and evaluation. Uh, Andy has a, a, uh, is a graduate of Holland State University with a, with a dual degree in economics and environmental studies. Andrew leads the PTE's distributed and a resource planning team and is responsible for PTE's distribution system planning. Uh, she, she, has, she has over 30, 13 years of professional energy experience in the energy industry, working in the utility, consulting, and public sectors. She holds a bachelor, degree, bachelor of Science degree in environmental science with a specialization in energy conservation and renewable energy from Ohio State University. So I thought that we start today's presentation off with a little bit of context setting. There's lots of definitions of distributed energy resources. Um, there's a national definition that the uh, name group has, which I really love. It's not the definition that we use for DERs in the state of Oregon. But the reason why I love neighborhood's definition is because it speaks to the location of a resource. It speaks to the benefits um, that you get from those types of resources and then gives examples of those resources. So neighbor speaks to being close to a customer site, which is very important when you think about utility planning. We typically speak about assets being in front of the meter or behind the meter, being customer owned or utility owned. Um, so the being close to a customer site gives you a lot of availability to um, cite that resource where you can. And that becomes really important when you think about things like solar, large scale solar energy storage where you might not be able to cite it um, on the customer site, or you might be serving a need that's at the distribution or transmission level. Um, as you can see, DERs, I, I like to use that term as an umbrella term for clean energy resources. It includes both in Oregon's definition as well as neighbor's definition that it includes distributed generation resources. It, uh, energy storage, demand response, energy efficiency, and electric vehicles. And what's not noted in here and some words that you might be familiar with, solar, and then um, also building launch certification. So for context setting, we are talking about those types of resources in this conversation. So what is distributed resource planning? This is a, uh, really you can think of it as a type of planning that looks at people, buildings, transportation, and, and clean energy resources. And it's all centered around asking questions about people, uh, who are the people we're serving, what are the types of buildings that we're looking at, what are their age, where they're located, um, and then what are the attributes of those resources. So for example, transportation electrification is a good resource to, to look at because you have to think about how people drive that vehicle. How do they charge it? Can you use that as a demand response resource? Can you use it uh, in terms of outages? Some of you might be familiar with the Ford F-150s and the people using those during outages in uh, Texas last year. But it's really just trying to understand people and, and technology. So that's, that is kind of a broad overview. The reason why it's really important because distributed resource planning is not just an analytical exercise, but it's an intersection between policy, uh, statewide goals, regulation, but it also is part of how communities and um, stakeholders or people who participate in energy think about, you know, how do they clean their future? How do they have sustainability goals? How do they think about resiliency? So the team that Andy and I work on, we focus on answering these questions and it's very, very broad. We might be doing technical analysis, we might be actually participating in policy. In Oregon, we've really seen a change that has moved us to starting to think about DERs as a resource. And the landscape has really been focused on modernizing the grid, having an equitable implementation and how we modernize that grid, 
And through those two things, that's created what we call a distribution system plan. There's not many states that have a distribution system plan. Of those states that have them, Oregon is unique. We really focus on equity as a core principle of our distribution system plan. It's very different than what we have in other states. Um, and so I think the landscape of policy in Oregon and the progressiveness of Oregon policy has enabled us to start thinking about how do we transform the grid into something that is equitable for all of those that participate in, in this. So traditional distribution planning really focused on kind of this cycle where you started with low forecasting. It was very high level. It was just taking who are the customers you are serving, the total load and the total peak demand across your entire service territory. It was doing system uh, assessment, looking at the resources you had, um, what type of needs that you might have, you have capacity constraint, you have a localized issue, then identifying um, what kind of needs specifically, is it a transformer, do you need a new feeder line, finding a suite of solutions, then putting it into construction, and then monitoring it. And you'll notice here that even though it is kind of a cycle, it never, the, the end process of monitoring and controlling those devices never really fed back into the planning process. And that was a, a real gap. The other gap is we saw that our programs, our DR programs like energy efficiency, and then the way that we connect to the grid for things like rooftop solar, we're not part of that planning process. They live outside of that distribution planning process. So our traditional delivery was really focused on this one-way flow of power. And you really see that when you start with your main delivery, a coal power plant, all the way down to homes, but wasn't interactive. And that, that's really critical um, in why this shift is needed when we start to think about distribution system planning. So here's what's different. As we start to think about distribution system planning, this transition from traditional planning to where we start to think about all components of the grid, we start to layer in DR programs, so energy efficiency programs, smart thermostat programs, uh, incentives for EVs. And we start to think about how they connect not just to our distribution planning, but all the way to our trans, uh, transmission planning and also our generation planning, so our integrated resource plan. We start to get more granular. So uh, the DRP team looks at who are the customers in the home? What are the behaviors? What are the load profiles? We start to look at every single hour of the day. We look at end uses. We look at um, different types of homes. So when we say residential, we will ask you, does it mean single family, multifamily, condo, or really um, attached garage, not attached garage? We're getting down to that granular level. And then we're starting to look at how the system is changing over time. Do we have the ability to uh, connect new resources to the grid that's called hosting capacity where there are constraints. Um, then we, when we look at grid needs, we start to think about communities. We start to think about what are the things that our communities need? Do they have sustainability goals? Do they have initiatives to uh, accelerate clean energy and for their fleets and their buses? We start to look at locational analysis. We start to think about what's the value of siting rooftop solar versus putting in a new transformer. When we think of resilience, that really opens the door to start using DERs as a resource. So rather than putting up poles and wires, uh, developing a new substation, we start to think about non-wire solutions, which are non-traditional um, investments, microgrids. But there's also this feedback loop to the community, understanding what's important to them. Is this what they really want? Is this what they need? Is it equitable? And then we, when we're in project design, we continue that community input process. And we start to think about how can we put on product, uh, system protections in order to use those devices. So as customers start to connect to the grid, how can we use those during long-term outages? How can we use those to... Um, be able to make sure that the grid is safe and stable for all of those that um, are on the grid. And then we start to monitor and control those devices and then feed that back into our planning. So um, the image that is on the screen to your, your left, this equitable energy delivery, this was our vision for how we started our distribution plan. Um, and you'll notice in the previous slide, there was that one-way flow of power going from coal power to the home. 
we looked at how do you put the communities that we serve at the center of what we do and how do all your investment decisions and all of the different decision-making processes lead to the uniqueness of each community that you're serving. Quite different than what other utilities are doing in, in the nation. But, can I have a quick clarification? Oh, yeah. Oh, I should have said, please feel free to interrupt yeah. me and ask as many questions as you want. Um, so PGE in Oregon, is it a fully integrated, like vertically integrated utility? So yes, like having all the way from generation to distribution. Yes. And how much of Oregon does it serve? Um, about 50% of the retail load. And I apologize. I have that on my slides. So we'll go over that in a few. Yeah. No. We should have put it up front, but we'll, it's about 50% of the uh, energy or electric needs in Oregon, uh, PGE serves. And uh, I actually just had this written down from a question I got yesterday. So about 50 cities and six counties across mm -hmm. the state. And so we have the major metropolitan area, the metropolitan rural areas. Right. So the plan is for your area? Yes, for, yes. And we have about 650, 680 feeders and about uh, 250 plus uh, substations. And so the planning on the distribution grid here is really for the first time in Oregon taking a comprehensive look at how that all fits together. So this is a very new and very challenging uh, exercise for the whole, you know, the regulator, regulator and stakeholder community as well as utilities and communities. But it's really been exciting to see it all come forward. So the distribution system plan is a regulatory requirement through the OPUC through Docket UN 2005, and is for all of the utility-owned investors and um, investor owned utilities, sorry. And so that's Idaho Power, Pacific Power, and then PGE. Um, and the next slide speaks to that regulation, and really what the, the intent of the commission was to develop a, a distribution system plan and why it was important. And so the OPUC really saw that a distribution system plan was going to be critical for them to realize their climate goals across the state. And so they had not just in addition to climate goals, but also equity goals. And um, they needed the utility to help them realize that vision. So the distribution system plan has really three main focuses. It's that community at the center, but it is intended to foster transparency by giving access um, to the public on the type of data that we have, how that data is used, and what is the potential of CERs, and then be able to use that data to make informed decision and gather um, feedback on how the grid should be modernized. The distribution system plan is a, what I call a near-term plan. It's, it's uh, specific actions within the next two to four years and a longer-term vision over the next uh, 10 years. So for us, when we were given this requirement to build a distribution system plan, we started with, okay, what is really the intent of the commission? What is their climate policy trying to get at? And then how can we make our DSP um, something that helps achieve the goals of the state and the customers that we serve? How often do you uh, do one of these DSPs? Yeah, so the distribution system plan is new uh, for this our first distribution system plan, it was split into two filings. We submitted the first filing in August of last year, or October of last year, and we'll submit the second part in August of this year. Then from there, we'll file every two years. That distribution system plan will look at um, our DR forecast, what are the needs that we have on the system, what is, are the types of solutions we can implement, and then what's the suite of actions and then that gets acknowledged as part of a regulatory process. And so um, you might hear this when we talk about uh, energy, we talk about providing safe and reliable power at affordable cost. And our vision was to change that to safe, secure, reliable, resilient power that's at fair and reasonable cost. And I think the fair and reasonable is really important when you think about equity um, versus affordability. Cool. If you don't mind, quick question. What other regulatory policy at uh, PUC is supporting the equity part of the project? Yes. Yeah, so in Oregon, we had a very, very big legislative session last year where a lot of our policies were focused on equity. So we have, uh, in the past, there was traditional um, 
interveners who got funding. They got they got money to be able to or got compensated to be able to participate and intervene into utility processes. But those dollars were never available for community-based organizations. So last year there was a bill that passed that allowed community-based organizations and environmental justice communities to be able to get compensation to provide their expertise in the decision making process for all utility aspects of the board. So that's one example. Um, there's also a ton of regulation with Andy probably could speak to around TE that's focused on equity. Yeah, we had a, a house bill. Or transportation electrification. We have an acronym so that too, so <laughs> we use a lot of those. I thought it was transactive energy. Yeah, that's, you know, that's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a transportation bill which focuses on calling out how much revenue utilities should collect and then spend on putting charging infrastructure in different communities of interest. And stakeholders, as the commission went through a robust process to get stakeholder feedback to define those. And so that's defined as sort of there's seven so coastal communities, uh, communities with low income, renters, uh, BIPOC communities, uh, frontier, and rural. And so that this is new. It's a new TE investment framework that's being rolled out. Um, and I have a slide in the, in the end we can get to if there's time, but House Bill 2021, which is our 100% clean uh, bill, is also heavily uh, informing now how utilities will plan for community impact of our not only supply resources, but then how distributed resources factor into meeting our, our decarbonization targets. Uh, and so I think. Yeah, so there's uh, my earlier slide that was the policy landscape that's changing, just have some notes on that. But really, um, it started with the governor's climate. So we started with legislation or um, executive orders which focused on uh, modernizing the grid and then also had equity components and has really transitioned into through a series of regulation and legislation and policy into uh, House Bill 2021, which was um, enacted last year. And that has several components. It has a clean energy target, which you'll see on the screen is to get us to 100% clean by 2040 but also ensures that the investments that we make are equitable. So we, there's language throughout about the equitable implementation of the distribution system plan, the equitable implementation of our integrated resource plan, but then focuses on DERs as a community resource. So there's components around community renewable um, resources and things like that. But um, I hope that answers your question. Okay. In short answer, like there's no shortage of, yeah. of uh, commission directives to try to answer this question. It's the challenge is how to wrangle them all together. So that at the state level, lots of policy and legislation, and then at the commission level, they've actually hired a DEI director who's focused on this, and there's a lot of policy, uh, a lot of regulation that's coming out around this. So for um, our distribution system plan, we really had this focus to figure out who were the key partners in creating a distribution system plan. You know, the utility is one component, right? We have our own goals, we have our own strategies, the only that are things that we kind of care about and that we need in order to be a sustainable business. But we also have customers that we serve and those customers have things that they need and that are important to them. And then we have uh, interveners and stakeholders and partners who care about the, the customers that we serve and are you know, advocates of different sectors, industrial or business sectors. Um, and then we have our commission. So there's a lot of people who participate in NBSP. So we had to start with some very basic vision and goals. And our um, initial thought was just radical transparency. Let's just be honest with where we're at. What can we do now? What can we not do? What, what are we not good at? Where are we in our infancy? And what are we really good at? Let's really lean into our community expertise. We are not equity experts, let's just be honest, we are utility experts, so we need to lean into our community-based organizations. We need enhanced engagement. This can't be just us speaking to our partners and our regulators um, and our customers. We need to have uh, to a flow of information and be able to take their feedback and implement it into our process. And it really has to be easy and understandable. I mean, nobody, um, we have a lot of people that come from a lot of different aspects of um, you know, educational backgrounds, uh, expertise is different. You know, we just need to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page and understanding what are the goals and things we're trying to achieve. So we have this vision to be a 21st century community-centered distribution system. 
Um, and that vision is linked to our corporate goals, which are to decarbonize, electrify, and perform for our customers. And that vision is tied to the goals of the state and our partners to advance environmental justice, to accelerate DERs, and to modernize the grid. And with that, we came up with five strategies. And these five strategies are focused on um, key areas that we think are necessary to achieve this uh, 21st century community center distribution system. It starts with empowering our communities, um, enabling their equitable participation in the clean energy future, modernizing the grid to make sure we can optimize uh, the resources that are on the grid that are new and be able to continue to have a safe, reliable system making sure that we have the ability to be resilient and withstand long-term um, outages, recover from them quickly, and then plug and play, which is access to the grid. How can you get, uh, you know, if you wanna be able to buy an EV, how can you get a charger and be able to connect that to the grid? And then finally, there is an evolved regulatory framework. The model in which we operate is old and doesn't, doesn't um, speak to this transition that we're going into. And we need to have a conversation about how regulation and policy is going to help us really be focused on this new transition. And so evolving the utility business model is critical. So those are the key components of our DSP. And then I have a, an in the weeds slide that speaks to some of the things that, that we're doing here. And I'm not gonna cover everything here, but if you see something that stands out, please feel free to, to ask me to go deeper. Um, so our empowered communities, quite frankly, we are in our infancy and we're really taking the first step into this process. And the first thing we needed to do is build a framework on how do you do human centered planning and what does that mean? Um, and what type of, uh, data, like what does it mean to incorporate DI into your, into your work? And for us, that means socioeconomics and demographic data as being a key component to our planning processes. And then how do we engage with our communities? We worked with three community-based organizations to develop best practices and develop some data analytics for us and put together a framework on how you would engage communities. Um, so we leaned into their expertise and um, showcased their work in our DSP with their own words. We didn't rewrite any of their, their recommendations. We published it as, as um, they wrote it. And then we were very transparent with where we are in our, uh, the DEI maturity model. So where we're really strong is modernizing the grid. We, you know, we're usually we're great at building things and keeping the uh, lights on for our customers, but there's a shift in how our goals need to, to be. So we need to really focus on decarbonization. We need to focus on assisting our environmental justice communities. We need to think about resiliency. Security is, is big, you know, safely using people's data and making sure that um, that's secured. And so, um, and then reliability has to be there. That has to be at the core of what we're doing. So we started with the US DOE's distribution system planning framework. And then um, we looked at our current process. How are we spending our dollars today? And where are we making investments? And we spent about $3 million into the distribution system, but only about three, or sorry, 300 million on the distribution system, but only about $3 million is invested in grid modernization. So that's gonna be a big shift when we look at our actions that we need to take. Well, all these are part of general education. Yes, so today, yes, today is all part of a, a general rate case. Yeah, yeah that, that's our capital expenditure. And so um, I'm more talking about the three million for the green bond in part of general rate case. Yeah, I think that, yeah, and that's, that's a capital. capital. It's over, that's an average, I believe, over the last five years, right? Yeah. And so that's what Angela's indicating is that as we now pivot and modernize the distribution grid to handle these excess DPRs, uh, that's going to shift our investment strategy. And I think, you know, typically our investment strategy has been capital investments, utility owned investments, but as we start to think about modernizing the grid using customer resources, DERs, those typically are not part of a capital process, so they will require a change in how we make investments, and, and that's part of also evolving the utility business model, because those aren't, aren't people use. Go ahead. So as you're looking at the different problems and your goals for modernizing the grid and increasing resiliency and you're evaluating potential solutions, 
how do you evaluate technology and then how do you work with tech companies to, to make sure that, that you're able to achieve your goals? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. And we are in the process of trying to answer that ourselves. <laughs> um, but we do, you know, I would say we have worked with, quite honestly, we've worked with a lot of tech companies on a variety of things. We do work with um, a variety of engineering firms and I'll just give one example. Typically we've worked with third parties to do our uh, forecasting for all of our DRs. We're trying to bring some of those things in-house to allow us to do more real-time um, data and analytics. So Andy will talk a little bit about a tool that we're developing called Adopter, which allows us to do in-house modeling and takes, uh, it's based Python-based and then pulls in a bunch of other like Caltech and um, what are the other big- uh, A lot of NREL open source mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. But I think um, on the question, I think around how do we evaluate new technology? So just like a lot of other utilities across the space, um, PG a number of years ago started developing more robust like uh, applied R&D. We call it the grid edge team. So we have those folks out there who are, are engineers and working on next generation technologies so that like at the edge of the grid. So whether it's either the new technology or just a new application of an, of an existing one. So things like long duration flow store, flow batteries, for example. That's a recent one we just announced uh, that we're doing one with a local manufacturer in, in the Portland area. Um, and we do things with, with that group like microgrids and other things. The challenging part is always, it's an, it's an engineering problem. And Lang and I were talking about this earlier. Um, there's a lot of engineering challenges, but then the business model and regulatory side to keep up with the pace of change needed to really meet these aggressive goals to decarbonize the whole system. Like if you zoom out and look at the US system, that's an insane challenge. And so it's gonna need everybody pushing in the same direction. And so it's really, uh, on the technology side, we have a lot of companies always pitching. I mean, utilities get that a lot. So we do recognize there's like a funneling problem of how do you not just entertain every single vendor that comes to talk to you, but and then how do you actually? So I, I think there's some slides there's, we could talk about the smart grid test that we've done, which is our sort of applied R&D uh, sandbox. Yeah, there's there's complications. I mean, there is we have to do re real time modeling, right? So when we think of technology, do we have the ability to do that and not just leverage a black box technology from a, a third party? So there are things that we need to bring in and be uh, have more technical competency and, and capabilities around. We also have, you know, how do you standardize standardize different technologies? So EV charging is a good example. There's lots of different ways to charge your car, you know, whether it's um, you know, using fast charging or level two, level one. And those those things make it really hard when you're starting to think about how you connect to the grid. And I think that those are the areas where we can really invest in R&D. And that's where we need to spend a lot of our focus in figuring out how we can do that. And it really differs between software and hardware companies. Like, mm -hmm. like there's a lot of startups who, um, just because of the nascency uh, or, uh, if, of those um, of, the, of those groups, it's hard to decipher like what's a really good sales pitch versus how do they actually perform interoperable you know, systems between different providers if they're aggregating DDRs or um, just providing different services. So yeah, and, and what's like fully vetted that you can connect to the grid and still ensure safety and reliability. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's a lot there. Um, the other components that are in our plan our resilience this really came out of this wasn't part of our initial um, vision for the DSP we got our rulemaking in 2020 but in 2021 we had a series of, uh, of extreme weather events we had ice storms we had heat domes we had uh, several days without power for our customers and that really brought to the forefront a need to make sure that we had a resilient system and so we have key focus areas where we're looking at customer infrastructure, our own infrastructure, and then how do we make sure that we have the operational capabilities to be able to deal with long-term outages. Our plug and play initiative is, um, I would say, still very focused on kind of the early stages or maturity there is, um, you know, in its infancy, we focused a lot about bringing transparency to how you can connect to the grids we have. Uh, GIS mapping that we did to show where there are substations that you can connect to without substantial interconnection cost, and where we have areas where um, you cannot connect because they would cost 
substantial amount of money to be able to update the grid. So um, we have those two mapping. And then I would say for our filing that is in August, we hope to have some actual projects that we can propose that would help customers connect to the grid in new ways, whether it's um, solar inverter programs or EV programs. Do you want to focus some time there? And then you can see in our evolved regulatory framework, there is quite a bit of policy that we need to coordinate with as we start to think about the distribution system and quite a bit of regulatory um, activities that we need to think about. But some key ones, and I, the one I like to point out the most is in um, Oregon, we use an IEEE standard 1547 that is pretty outdated. It's not the most recent version of that standard. It is implemented into code. And it, what it basically does is it um, doesn't allow us to utilize a customer solar system. It doesn't require a customer to put a smart inverter on their solar system. And this presents a lot of challenges. So um, if the customer doesn't have an uh, inverter, it's not safe. We can't, if we have an outage event, we have to shut off their system. We have to protect the system for all customers. So it doesn't feed back onto the grid. Um, we're really pushing the state to change that policy so that way it requires customers to install a smart inverter so that way they can safely use their equipment during outage. But then also if we have a time where we have not enough uh, energy or capacity to be able to serve the system and we might have to shut down equipment that we might be able to actually call on that equipment and use it just like we would if we had a power plant. So. That's a, a, a key example of some regulatory activity that we think could change and really help us, you know, modernize the distribution system. Next slide. Okay, so there's two more slides that I have, and I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into two things. One is our um, power community, and I think this is what makes our CSP very unique, which is leading with the DI lens. So there's a couple of components to that. Human-centered planning focuses on procedural justice, making sure that our customers and our partners have a seat at the table and that they're not just at the table, but that they have, a, they're able to be part of that decision-making process. That's really important. Um, making sure that we, get, we have distributed justice is a key component of our planning. So that's um, making sure that we have equal benefits and costs that represent society. So today, when we look at cost effectiveness, we typically look at utility costs and benefits. We need to start integrating things like societal costs, greenhouse gas, air quality, and also customer benefits. You know, what's the benefit of reducing energy and making sure that they're part of the cost effectiveness equation. And then restorative justice. We've had, you know, there are, quite a few things that we, that in the past, I think we could acknowledge that we did not look at all of our customers and serve them equitably and there's that did cause harm to our um, some of our customers and we need to make sure that we restore that to them and restore that trust. For our community engagement, then I would say also for human centered planning, I haven't mentioned this and it's not one of the bubbles, but really should be is also data and analytics. So integrating things like um, U.S. Census data, there's some tools out there through companies called GreenLink that bring in uh, socioeconomic and demographic data, integrating that into how we do our planning. So, for example, if we are going to be making an investment area, an investment in an area, really understand what type of customers we serve, um, what are their backgrounds, is English a second language, what's their income level, and making sure that we are equitably investing across our service territory. And then um, DEI, we've really focused on the core component is leaning into those community experts, as I mentioned earlier. Sorry, I was answering a question on the chat. Yeah, no worries. Okay, this is also in the weeds slide, but one thing I wanted to leave you with, because this feeds into Andy's slide, is as we modernize the grid, there is a framework which we, we need to consider. And the framework now is not just pieces of physical equipment, but actually looks at customers and planning and um, starts to bring in things like a virtual power plant and looks at foundational capabilities, but also layers that into some more advanced analytics. 
So today, this is a, a suite of projects where we're at with four capabilities. And so Andy is going to touch on some of these, but I'd like to highlight, um, you know, our virtual power plant that is going to be able to allow us to combine different DRs and be able to use those to just like we would use as a power plant, which is kind of cool. Uh, our adopter tool, which is our in-house modeling, which allows us to real time be able to see what are the impacts of DERs on our system and how do things like policy, incentives, cost, um, change adoption over time. And then um, we have our ADMS system, which will allow us to have a platform. What, what's our uh, VP has this, you mentioned this earlier when we were talking, has a name for our, our ADMS, our little tag phrase. For the IOC and ADMS will buy being the nerve center. Yeah, for the, the nerve center. The future of the grid. Yeah, our integrated operations center is our new center, which allows us to operate all of our assets and customer sided assets as well. So that's, what does ADMS stand for? It's an advanced distribution management system. Okay. So it provides more real-time sensing and control of voltage, current, and other kind of dynamics, like in the, in the distributed part of the grid. Back to that early point where Angela said, you know, historical planning was all done with like maybe annual energy flows or like at, at best, like one peak time measurement. Mm -hmm. So now we're uh, in the situation where because we have more two-way power flow, we need a lot better visibility of just what's happening. And not just for safety, like if line workers are out there and there's um, distributed generation back feeding onto the grid and they're working on the wires, that's a, obviously a health and safety risk, but more for control and balancing out the loads is, is kind of what I'll get into. Okay. And so um, and I do have the ADMS is the main platform, and then the DR management system, yeah. and DR man, they are all modules on, on that. that yeah, okay, thank you. Technology. I have a couple more slides on that so we can go on that. So thanks, Angela. Um, and so I'm Andy Iden, I'm a principal planning analyst on Angela's team on the distributed resource planning team. So I think before I jump in, I mean, first of all, thank you, Angela, for, for being the one to go long versus <laughs> making me always be the one rambling. <laughs> but not, not that you were, I mean, my slides, I have a lot of slides I'm trying to we say. We present a lot. And I, will, it's always, yeah. I will go fast through these, but I'll skip some towards the end just to save time and we can kind of dwell on that after a good time. But I wanted to say um, a few things I'll just highlight from what Angela says. It's really kind of critical for how Oregon is different, or at least like what we see as a really unique uh, position is this community focus and customer first like attitude towards uh, grid modernization and uh, development of these DDR programs and how they get into the field. Um, so I think there's some local uh, initiatives that really are uh, to the forefront, like Portland has a clean energy fund, which is focused on a just and equitable transition. So even though we mentioned the utility being in their infancy in how we deal with issues of racial equity within a planning process, our recognition is that our communities are not that way. It's like they're out there on the front lines trying to strive for you know, justice in terms of how climate change and other um, aspects of this whole thing go forward. And I think you'll get a sense for the slides, like how much activity is happening. I think Angela set the stage for really what's the policy landscape, what's the planning like high level, even though we got into the weeds there, there's a lot on the customer side that PG is really pushing on because we just recognize our customers are demanding it. They demand more clean energy. They want it reliable and safe. They want it, uh, they expect that of their utility. And so I think it's my experience. I, I used to work at, in sort of energy efficiency and coming to PGE. It has been um, very interesting to see that, that they're taking it that seriously. So a quick thing I mentioned, I'll have the slide on our service area. So we are a vertically integrated investor owned utility uh, with about 900,000 uh, retail customers. And we serve about half of the uh, population, I guess, uh, but 75% of the commercial activity. Um, and then you can see uh, House Bill 2021, we mentioned is Oregon's uh, flagship 100% uh, clean bill. And we have milestones in 2030 for 8% targets uh, ramping up to 100% uh, by 2040. And you can see our current power generation mix on the right-hand side there. So as we work down towards phasing out that base load fossil generation, I mean, that's gonna happen really rapidly. And there's a whole host of, of challenges and opportunities with that. Uh, and that's a little snapshot of our service area and sort of where the generation comes from. Uh, we're about, um, well, 3,300 uh, megawatts of generation. So, you know, in California, you all are used to speaking a lane gigawatts. But um, <laughs> are we actually, our peak load grew by 10% over the last summer because it was about 4,000 megawatts and we're dual peaking. So historically, there's been a historic uh, summer and winter split. But during the heat dome events, uh, 116 degrees over multiple days, we reached 4,400 megawatts on like three successive days, I think. 
So we shattered our past uh, peak, peak loads like multiple times last summer. And so for all the reasons of health and safety of our customers and the reliability of the grid, there's definitely a huge focus now on, I mean, we also have ice storms. And so there's, there's a, a joint uh, resiliency and kind of climate aspect to all of this. Uh, but we're really trying to build a foundation to deliver this reliable, affordable, clean electricity, like Angela mentioned. And some of the stuff I'll go through uh, talks to the modernized grid aspect of this, but I think our group being particularly suited between uh, the grid engineers and sort of the traditional utility um, activities uh, and our customers and how to plan for this huge change. I think that's the really unique uh, lens that our group has. Um, so I'm gonna leave this up for a minute. You can kind of browse at it. This is sort of uh, the all in one uh, I guess, way to envision the EDMS and the, the sort of smart grid uh, as, I mean, this is probably a couple months stale. I mean, this is, this is an active evolution, both because I think, as you mentioned, these elements are going through rate cases. And um, this is obviously a plan that is subject to regulatory oversight and community uh, and stakeholder buy-in. So, but this is how we're trying to envision uh, bringing more DDRs into a sort of a platform, like right? migrating the grid towards away from sort of a commodity sales framework towards a, a platform with multiple revenue opportunities. And in the middle there is sort of the grid management system where we're rolling out uh, EMS and expanded ADMS capabilities. So those, uh, some of the grid mod things, which I think I have in the backup slides, but some really important ones I think uh, are like Flizzer, like fault location and isolation, service restoration and distribution automation uh, activities generally. That's kind of on the, the grid engineer side, so if any electrical engineers in the room, I mean, we have a ton of stuff in that arena, but the stuff outside the cloud, I guess, is what our group mostly uh, is interested in, like how do buildings and battery storage at customer homes, uh, how can those aggregate to provide value? Um, do you have a question? Well, yeah, I was gonna let you finish. <laughs> no, go for it. Uh, so the ADMS system, um, what are the, the time scales that it's looking to make decisions? Is it at like the 15 minute AMI interval reading or are you so we have to... we have um, AMI meters at about 99.9% .9 of our customers with uh, either 15 or 60 minute reads right now. So the ADMS will actually provide more like, I don't know if it's every four seconds or every, so right now, you know, the trip, the balancing authority. So PGE is, a, is our own balancing authority. We have to on the inner ties down in California, we have to maintain frequency and other uh, load commitments uh, every four seconds. And so those resources shift in a big way. So if 200 megawatts of our wind might cut out in 50, I mean, that doesn't happen in four seconds, but the frequency reads come in every four seconds. And um, the IOC, which uh, I guess it's not on here, but Angela mentioned mm -hmm. it. Is it? Mm -hmm. It's okay. under the germs. It's actually I'm like reading that. the graphic with you, you all. You don't know how to read the words anymore. Where you so, so yeah, the IOC uh, will be sort of integrating the distribution and transmission operations mm -hmm. into one coherent area. But I don't know the exact time step of the ADMS. I do know it's, it's more on the second scale versus um, and sometimes instantaneous for especially the, the flizzer uh, where those, I mean, it depends on the function, but mm -hmm. I would say that we're definitely going more towards real-time control, mm -hmm. not invisibility. Um, we're still building it out and we hope to have it completed. Basically, so the, the AMI is months. a 50 minutes meter. Yeah. And the scatter you see on the bottom mm -hmm. left, mm -hmm. that's every four seconds mm -hmm. scan in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not something that PGE would build out. Y'all buy that from a third party. We implement, vendor. but we so we invest capital to do that, and then we have yes. a rate case where that gets adjudicated. And but we yes, we're not building that ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are contracting with a with a software firm to build that. Mm -hmm. um, and our, we, our own tool. So we're, yeah, so it's our we're having a third party build it for us, but we will own it and operate it. Yeah. Wow. So the AMI part of ADMS or the specific module, it'll be rolled in. It, it will feed it uh, probably through the EMS. Um, so the AMI data will will uh, be aggregated through probably the, the data lake, and it's available through you know our, we have a team of data scientists at PGE that you know work on developing new ways to uh, aggregate the AMI data and make it visible for grid operators. Mm -hmm. You know that's still that's being built right now, and we have some internal tests that we're sort of um, the ADMS is kind of the foundational investment though mm -hmm. because. You need the actual measurements to come back from the field before you actually implement a whole bunch of advanced analytics. Yeah. To, I mean, I mean, you can get a lot with 15 minute AMI data if you in, can get in terms of data. like past yeah. patterns and informing your planning. But yeah, and we need to update our AMI meters. They're mm -hmm. about eight, ten years old, mm -hmm. so we're in the process of updating us to the newest. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, like that. And the whole conversation around this is how much data do you want to store mm -hmm. uh, in your system, like, and for how long? Mm -hmm. So, like, we can't collect voltage data and frequency right now from the meter, but it's not that great mm -hmm. in terms of using it for um, power quality, uh, real time management. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a question that people are asking. Because, yeah. But they do have a lot of slides, and I know this yeah. is like you all. Probably I wouldn't advance past this slide if you, because I know that's this course. We can stay on it if you want. Um, we'll come back to it. Uh, does that answer your question, though? Okay. Yes. And I am not the ADMS expert, so I, also I want to move past it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but some of the interesting things um, I'd say we'll get into more. I'm I'm mostly in charge here at uh, DER forecasting, and so you can see some of how we lay that out and uh, communicate it back to this uh, central system to coordinate those resources, but. That's all obviously in flight as still markets and regulatory context keep changing. So I think there's a mix of like law and business um, students in the course is what I was told. So I, definitely all of this is um, very live across the industry and the West Coast in particular as um, as decisions and, and different players are entering the market and it's disrupting uh, you know the status quo in a big way. So it's definitely no shortage of um, interesting work in this field. Uh, that's something that you quickly learn as you as you participate. Um, on the program, so I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about the program side. How do we forecast uh, for for things like transportation electrification? But this slide is here showing flexible loads. So if you go, uh, if you think about uh, balancing new new demands on the grid uh, using these customer resources, is one way to accomplish that with lower cost. So this is kind of our conception. We're trying to move quicker from you asked earlier about technology companies and I would say this is more on the end of the hardware but we do have a significant amount of these all of these programs I guess these are all programs that I can talk through a couple but they like single family water heaters is right in the middle so PG has a pretty large um, compared to other utilities like we're going really hard after residential aggregated loads and, and being able to shift those and so that's a program thing to go and roll more people in programs that give them incentives to allow this kind of control of their device and then we aggregate that up and use it as a peaking resource. Um, but then that comes with, you know, who's the who's the vendor putting the switch out there? What kind of software do they have to track and aggregate the data and uh, provide you that that device level data that that the power operations and control room folks at PGE can actually see and, and rely on? So this is all kind of part of a demonstration uh, moving towards programs as they get more mature. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see something called Energy Partner. Which is our larger CNI commercial and industrial um, like load shedding program. A lot of other utilities around the country, they might have like like oh like 600 megawatts, and it's it's in their demand response portfolio. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes that can be like a curtailment tariff where you're just paying people to turn off their load. All of these right here are uh, active shifting of loads, and so it's not just giving them a price signal. I mean that's great. We don't typically have a lot of heavy industry in the Northwest. We have a lot of like high tech data centers and high tech manufacturing companies that that don't want to curtail load, um, but they're open to ship. Actually, you know, it's really a challenge of how to get those customers involved in any of these programs, just because they have such a sensitive product line. But for all these other ones, I think PG is doing a really great job of um, casting a wide net. So there's a lot of, of variability in this, uh, or a lot of like. Uh, um, diversity in the mix. And this is kind of 2021 as a snapshot. We had 82 megawatts of enrolled uh, demand response uh, and then 54 for winter. And this is a big challenge, as I said, because we're dual peaking. So a lot of other places can just run like Utah, I know Pacific Corp and other places like with in California, like summer peak load is just such a driver. And, and you have also a lot more cooling to cur cur curtail or shift. We're getting more cooling in the Northwest, but it hasn't historically been a big deal. Uh, I mean, it's been it's been a big deal, but now it's taking on more proportion. But it's harder for us to get, you know, winter time demand response because uh, people may not want their thermostat to be messed with in the winter time when it's cold. Um, and we also just have a more, I guess, a higher penetration of gas furnaces and things like that, which you would need uh, more electric heating in the winter to control uh, to actually shift that load. Uh, okay, I'm going to check. Oh, I have five minutes. All right, transportation. This was kind of. Um, one of the areas we wanted to hit on. So the utility role in Oregon and around the country, but in Oregon, we're seeing a lot of activity uh, around how can the utility accelerate the transportation uh, transformation. So I'm not gonna go into these, it's just a lot of uh, different activities. One thing I'll call out is, um, 
I think in the R and D side, like we're exploring things like pole charging uh, we have up there, and that's to make it more equitable for people who don't have single-family residences. They can kind of park on the street, and then it's actually cheaper to then put the charger directly on the utility pole. So we worked with City of Portland to get that. You have to like change the city code and ordinances and all kinds of stuff. So we invested a lot of time to working with those partners, and now we're trying to figure out. So how can we deploy this at scale? And so I'm just going to jump ahead because I want to touch on some of our modeling work, um, which all of this is painted a picture of like how do we get from this political context or policy context towards actually planning the system and uh, trying to gear up for the ERs uh, that are that are coming more and more. So this is a study that we published um, with our first phase of the DSP. So it it encapsulates a lot of what we're trying to do on the DRP team. Uh, and this is a, a study that was authored by Cadeo and Brattle uh, with support from some other contractors. And what we did also is not just study the resource potential, but also build a model that we could then use because it's such a quickly moving market that we need to be able to quickly execute on new scenarios as the market changes. Um, this is quickly an overview of the model itself. So we start, as Angela mentioned, with really deep market segmentation of who our customers are and what kind of devices they have that could enroll in a program and, and what's their load profile. Like how does that change over the season and over the, uh, you know, every hour of the year. And then we look at going from left to right, just we call it measures, but any kind of technology that might be a EV charger or a thermostat program that we might want to control uh, to shift load to make it more amenable to the grid. And then we look at the building stock and actually like for DMV, that's an example, we use DMV data and then simulate every eight years or 10 years, someone's going to buy a new vehicle. So in our model, we capture it all at the site level and then sort of say, okay, now someone's going to buy an electric vehicle in year eight and we simulate out 30 years. So we're tracking everything at the site level uh, to come up with a, basically a system-wide potential for all of these customer sited resources. Um, and then we get all the way to the right. We add some economic screening uh, to really say, is this the right investment for people to make? And then um, we add some locational uh, factors because we're all trying, we're trying to tie it back to the distribution grid. So we're aggregating all these site level uh, findings up to the, to the distribution system. Um, just gonna quickly touch on this and then I'll probably skip some slides. Uh, so this is our adopter model that Angela mentioned. So we move towards that radical transparency lens, trying to say, let's not have another consultant like black box uh, approach. We wanted to build something that our communities, our stakeholders, our regulators can really understand and engage with. Um, you know, it's a work in progress, but it's still highly technical. And that is part of the barrier. It's how to make it approachable, but uh, we're using a comprehensive open modeling framework. So if folks are familiar with the Caltrack methods uh, in California, that was developed for sort of weather normalizing end use load data uh, for purposes of evaluating these kind of end use um, approaches to, to controlling load. And then we're using Python to run this uh, from end to end. And we're incorporating a lot of like NREL and other DOE uh, open source toolkits like uh, Evy Pro Lite for EV charging infrastructure, uh, Reopt for uh, sizing microgrids and things like that. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all the, the bullets on the side there, but it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so here's all the, the DERs we're modeling. And we're, these are growing actually, this was our last study. I think we just added a bunch of emerging tech like end user electrolyzers for industrial direct use application for hydrogen uh, and things like that, which we're still working through. But, you can kind of see the big ones here. I mean, solar and storage and electric vehicles are typically what grid planners care about the most. Like demand response is interesting for programs people and it's important as that resource grows, but historically it's been rather small, but storage or solar and electric vehicles are the big ones. I mean, you, you all in California are, are light years ahead for solar than we are, but we do see the curve coming. Um, and so I'd say on the right-hand side, it shifts more into our demand response flexible load portfolio. Uh, so you can see all the different smart water heating and HVAC that we're modeling, uh, as well as some pricing programs that are on the right with uh, peak time rebates and time of use, just paying customers to like, here's a behavioral signal, you can see it, it's a peak time of day, and you need to reduce your energy use. So you all in California, I think, have the, uh, the flex market, which is pretty new, but um, we're doing this in the context of a utility vertically integrated, trying to sort of um, operate and, and control these programs. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these. I mean, we do some some cool statistical models and other things, but I want to want to give time to show. Well, let me actually linger here for a minute. This is our transportation. Just to touch on this, so in the model, we develop basically a list of variables in that long table, and then 
We're using some uh, uh, structured approaches to study uh, which have the best explanatory power. And then we only keep in the ones that are you know, relevant and interpretable. Uh, but on the right hand side, you kind of see how we're putting these into, into buckets, recognizing that because we're doing everything at a site level, we need to know like, well, how is income and uh, location? And uh, like you can see up there, there's a number of vehicles that the existing customer has a, a big impact on whether or not they'll adopt EV, um, household income and other things like that, how far they drive. So these uh, factor in then and we sort of uh, get towards a locational uh, propensity to adopt. Um, and this is kind of our scorecard. So we do this for every every DER that I mentioned on that chart. Uh, we com compute a, a sort of scorecard like this where base points then get added and subtracted based on each of these variables to really be able to, the important point here is to, since we're doing it for all 900,000 sites in our service area, we're computing this, it has to be a scalable sort of solution. So the model, you know, necessarily has to be simplified. It can't be like, you could put a lot more data science into this, but it wouldn't scale as fast, or at least it would take a lot more development effort. Um, so that's, uh, I think, really interesting. And I know we're close to time. Actually, we're over time. I can, um, I can pause there if you need to close. Um, let me know how you want to do it. There's some questions uh, in the oh. Q&A. Yeah, I can pause there. I'll, I'll project those questions so that we can see. Um, uh, we're working on OSI for the EMS. Well, I don't know about the EMS, ADMS, and OSI. Hope I hope that's not confidential. Don't talk about the Oh, yeah. And the rest of the slides, I'm trying, they were super cool. We want to see this later. I'm just kidding. It was more of the, I was just going more to the modeling approach. I think the, that's all, as you can say, as I said, like that's the flavor of uh, what we're trying to do on the planning side to sort of keep pace with. The rapidly evolving regulatory side. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have any big takeaway conclusion slides, so you're not missing anything. <laughs> and Andy has answered those questions. Yeah. yeah, and with BPA, I failed to mention on there, I mean, we do definitely on the hydro side, like for procurement, like uh, getting our spot market, like the, the mid sea, mid Columbia, the series of dams that BPA controls. Um, uh, we definitely have a lot more than the relationship that I indicated, which was more about. Balancing authority as transmission obligation, but um, so there's a there's a lot of relationship there, which I won't go into because I'm not the expert. Um, yeah. So the second one's about memoirs uh, solutions, or also memoirs alternatives, and uh, the OPUC as part of the distribution system plan requires that we propose at least two non uh, memoirs solution projects, and they're not required to be cost effective and that will be filed in our August filing and I, there is probably going to be I should have mentioned this earlier we're in um, initial rulemaking so the commission will use our two filings to finalize the rulemaking probably in 2023 and everything we submit will inform the, the outcome of our final rulemaking but I would suspect Andy that non-wire solutions will be a requirement of our final um, rulemaking but we'll propose at least two projects this and Andy's working on the modeling for that. Do you want to speak? Yeah, so we so when we do, if we focus on two substations, for example, the model that I was showing, um, you know, we'll be able to then isolate for that geography how many multifamily buildings there are, and that typically has a different, you know, preponderance of electric versus gas, like heating, or if there's a lot of low income building stock that could benefit more from energy efficiency, uh, and or there's just like we know how many water heaters there are that we could enroll in the demand response program. Or and one thing we're doing, which is we're using NREL's uh, PV watts module to uh, identify solar potential, as well as their DGEN model, which um, is a bottom-up forecasting model for solar and storage. And so we will run this model for those two locational non-wire pilots and then work with our communities, again, to what Angelo is saying, to make it community-centered and driven to say, okay, here's the resource potential and how do we actually go get it? And there's, there's conversations about, you know, how do we actually invest in those communities to do the work themselves, like installation of, of weatherization measures or solar and, and things like that. So it's, yeah, it's gonna be a lot, it's gonna be like a pretty crazy uh, five months. <laughs> our, to our, answer the second part of that question, just quickly, the way that we're integrating equity into our decision-making process is we have a portfolio of capital projects that we'll review. We prioritize those based on their ability to, um, you know, the priority of, of like, how much risk there is, 
continue to provide safe, reliable power. We rank those as part of that prioritization process. What we'll also be doing is integrating socioeconomic and demographic data to identify areas that um, are traditionally underserved or vulnerable populations, and then be able to prioritize those projects as well as um, the projects that also have safety and reliability concerns. Last question. Um, are, are you modeling at uh, two substations because it's too difficult to scale out past that, or you're just your hyper localized? It's just that was the requirement by the or the WUT mm -hmm. was to do because we have to do two proposals that are thoroughly like laid out with, with respect to cost benefits and equity considerations. So the model we have will be able to generate and look at any substation. But what we will do is we'll have ability to run like parametric runs, zoning in on those two with like very much uh, granular maybe avoided costs. So the avoided cost of deferring a substation depends on where it is. If it's $10 million over here versus $20 million over there, that gives you the pot of money you can actually defer. And then that can go into a local program. Or you know, it could be a big battery. It could be a bunch of small batteries. It could be no batteries and just a bunch of weatherization and demand response or solar. It really depends on the context of what actually great constraint you're trying to solve for. Like if it's a peak load at 5 p.m., that can give you, and it's all residential customers, that gives you a, a box of what kind of programs on the customer side you could do. If it's more like an industrial growth where it's all flat, you need to reduce that load over a much longer period of time. So you maybe need different solutions. Do you want to answer the question on the Yeah, the EV, um, have, we have about 26,000 EVs on the road in Oregon, that, or in PG service area, I should say. Um, so I think, I don't know what percent of load it is now, but I think we're projecting it'll get up to about 20% of sales and, uh, by 2040-ish. Um, I don't, I mean, hundred percent, I wish, uh, that will be a ways off. We're, we're sort of closely modeling after California's uh, 2035, uh, ice ban. So like we do see like in 2032, 2035 timeframe, there's a big inflection point in our forecast. Um, we, in Oregon, like we just adopted actually a model, um, a clean trucks rule that follows California's. And so definitely for medium and heavy duty, I mean, that is still very much emerging. We have a. I have some slides which we can show some of our partnerships with like Daimler Trucks North America. They have their headquarters in Portland. So we just launched like a, a flagship uh, public charging station for like long haul trucks. And so, but those are all still in demonstration mode, which is mostly, I mean, California, you all will probably get those on the roads a lot quicker. I mean, Oregon's catching up. Whoever's watching, don't, uh, don't get me wrong. Um, and we will, we certainly have a lot of, we have our, our transit provider who's uh, got plans to electrify or at least, you know, have zero emission buses by 2040 for like 700 plus of their fleet. So we're working closely with them. Uh, school buses, we have a, a pilot program. I'd say, I'm sorry, I'm not like sticking to the question, but the, 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 whether the lines can transmit the additional power is something that right now we're focusing on the DER and transportation forecast. The process over the next probably six months till we file the part two of the distribution system plan will be that other end of the of the stick. Like, do we have the additional capacity? How much investment will that take? Um, we're looking at distribution system, obviously, and so I think for transmission, um, that's something that the IRP would contemplate because um, they look at the bulk power flows and things like that. But we do include the EV forecast in the IRP, so um, I think for for now we're looking good, but that could. Especially as as the heavier duty, heavy duty vehicles, if they start adopting more like megawatt scale charging at scale, like to just do if that's like an important business case for them to actually convert their whole fleet, is they need to have rapid megawatt scale charging. Then that's I mean those are all game changers. So like this is that's why we built this tool to be very flexible and nimble because six months after you do it, it's out of date um, because the market is just so rapidly evolving. So uh, today, the model that Andy's building at forecasts out what we think is the, the trend and what's the most realistic adoption in the near term, which was built on assumptions from 2020. He will be updating the model this year to be able to predict like 100% load, like the question that, that was posed here, or how does policy influence those state? The state of Oregon has a policy um, or an initiative to go to 100,000 vehicles by 2030. Like, a, like a, over a million vehicles by 2030. And I okay. think that's 50% of vehicles on the road by 2030 is our the legislative target and 50, uh, 25% of new sales, new car sales by 2030. Um, and then obviously, I mean, politically, right, there's policy that adopts similar to California, like any kind of other bans on ICE vehicles that would change things in the out years. Um, so this is all definitely, sorry, that's the best I think we can do on that, on that one. Uh, business model reforms. Do you want to talk about that in the in the DSP? How we teach that up? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so today the we've been open to you know we've we've told the commission that we need to have a conversation around utility business model reform. We haven't actually come out and said that there is any one specific model that that works well. We've provided context on um, to the commission on different types of models. So it could be uh, performance incentive. It could be performance um, like a rate based incentive. So we're looking to probably propose something in our second part. So kind of like the question that was previous asked that Andy commented on, we'll be predicting impacts of EVs in our part two. We'll also be probably making some recommendations on utility business model reform in our part two. Yeah, in the terms of the stakeholder landscape, like Oregon has been looking at business model reform for a long time, recognizing that the utility incentives need to be better aligned with in order to move in a certain direction. Um, but there, that's a complex stakeholder landscape. So um, I would say that in agreement with Angela, like we're, we're making efforts to say, here's how you shouldn't view uh, something that is more uh, O and M expense, which typically then utilities IOUs cannot earn greater return on that. They only earn rate of return on steel and ground infrastructure investments or long lived like IT investments. And so the question is how to then motivate a utility to aggressively pursue something that is against their business model. I mean, that's the conversation. Um, and they're, you know, that's playing out in different ways across the country. Um, so I think uh, that's, that's where we see that going. But it's definitely uh, to meet our goals, we, we recognize you need to get, again, all, all ships pointing in the same direction. And I would say that uh, our particular focus in terms of business model reform is really um, as we start to shift in how we invest in resources, how do we recover and earn on those to stay whole as a company, right? We, we need to be able to still pay our bills and our, and our employees. And so how do you how do you do that and um, still transition into that? And I think that this is a good question for a Stanford student to answer. <laughs> so I'll pose it back oh, to yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the, number six or number six yeah. is, i find it interesting that they knew with the west clean yeah west I, have west a, clean transit I have a slide on that I, this was 40 slides down from where i got to so sorry for <laughs> <laughs> lack of planning on my part but um the west coast clean transit was kind of a high level so basically looking at uh electrifying i5 all the way from mexico to canada and it was a nine utility partnership pg funded that as well, as well as a number of california and washington utilities it's really um meant to say like for corridor traffic up and down, what is the infrastructure need? Um, what is the next research question from that study, which was led by HDR group, uh, is really how does intersection of local delivery routes and like shared use of a public charging infrastructure hub like that really come to impact? Like how, like we don't know yet how people will prefer depot charging, like overnight charging versus public fast charging for, for trucks and delivery. Uh, so that's that's very much like the next cutting edge question So that. So it's it's impacting our planning to the extent that, um, I mean, we we promoted the study and we funded it, uh, but it's but its ultimate use was to get more alignment across uh, parties on the West Coast. And I think for how it hits our distribution system plan, like until someone goes and says, we need a super fast charging public in your service area, that's when we'll start saying, okay, here's where we have extra um, ability to host something like that. So I was not PGE when that story, that study was, um, done, I was actually leading it for Pacific Corp. And basically the outcome of that study showed that for heavy duty vehicles, you're going to have more charging outside of a major metropolitan area and you'll have more um, medium duty vehicles like delivery trucks within a city. And then also looked at their charging behaviors and the radius in which that they would drive and be charged. So I think all of that is encompassed in Andy's model or will be at some point. And really just understanding what are the driving behaviors and the load needed to meet that those types of vehicles so just to give you some scale for heavy duty vehicles you would need the equivalent of a 25 megawatt substation to meet that load for charging at any given station i mean it's substantial um and i think that that's a challenge when we think about heavy duty transit up and down the, the west coast yeah <sighs> I see more chats in here. Like, how, how long do you want to keep just going? Um, maybe because I don't have a whole list to do, but you all want to be in the We should wrap up. Yeah. We should. So, thank you guys for coming.